Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today we conclude our analysis of the second solar spectrum and do so by highlighting that helium should actually be viewed as a group 2a element on the Sun. I have already covered many aspects of helium chemistry in these videos. You can revisit them in order to strengthen your understanding of this presentation. If you examine the periodic table, helium is usually positioned with the noble gases, as seen here. But unlike the noble gases, the last closed outer shell for helium is actually an S shell, just like the group 2A elements, since the electronic configuration of helium is 1S2. Conversely, for the noble gases, their outermost electronic orbital is a closed P6 shell. As a result, helium may well be placed with the group 2A elements. But what is the justification for this claim relative to the chemistry on the Sun? First, try to consider what is happening with the noble gases in the solar atmosphere, namely helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. We begin by listing the gases, their first ionization energies, and the inferred log of photospheric abundances as taken from Lauder's paper. Clearly, helium possesses the highest first ionization energy of 23.7 electron volts. Neon is not far behind at 20.8 electron volts. But then the first ionization energies drop significantly with values of 15.2, 13.5, and 11.7 electron volts for argon, krypton, and xenon respectively. The photospheric abundances of these elements must be viewed with extreme caution as they are always derived from indirect arguments either from helioseismology in the case of helium or coronal electronic transitions and solar winds in the case of the others. Obviously, helium has the greatest abundance amongst these, being considered as the second most abundant element on the Sun after hydrogen. Interestingly, however, neon with a value of 8.15 rivals oxygen with a value of 8.71 for the third most abundant element after hydrogen and helium. Yet, other than for helium, no lines from any of the noble gases occur in the Fraunhofer spectrum or in the chromospheric emission spectrum observed during an eclipse. For instance, neutral neon, argon, and krypton lines are not observed in either spectrum as can be gathered through these papers. This is how Pierce describes the situation relative to the chromospheric spectrum. A comparison of the chromospheric spectrum with the spectrum of argon, neon, krypton, and xenon leads to many coincidences, but a careful examination leads one to the conclusion that the spectra of these elements do not appear on our plates. Powerful lines from neon and argon in these states, however, have been observed in the emission lines in the solar corona, as one can learn in the footnoted text. It has been argued that the 6402.2 angstrom line from neutral neon can be seen in emission during bright events in the inner corona, as can be seen in this paper. Importantly, during a solar flare, lines from argon-14 appear to become greatly amplified, as one can learn in this paper. A 2s, 2p2, doublet s1/2 to 2s2, 2p, doublet p1/2 transition at 194.4 angstroms occurs in this case, which has not been forbidden. That line, however, is not prominent on the disk in the quiet sun, as can be gathered by examining Appendix 2 in this text. I have stated that coronal emission lines are likely to be produced as a result of electron transfer to positively charged coronal material, as one can learn in this paper. Such processes must also be considered relative to coronal emission lines of the noble gases. There is not much more to say about the transitions observed in neon and argon at this stage, other than to emphasize once again that these transitions are only being seen during solar activity or within the corona. As a point of interest, however, hydride cations of both neon and argon, namely neonium and argonium, are known to exist in the laboratory, and argonium has been found in the astrophysical setting, although none of these compounds have ever been seen on the Sun. Now let us move to helium. Like the other noble gases, helium exhibits numerous emission lines in the UV as summarized in this table. Lines from both helium-1 and helium-2 are observed. In order to better discuss helium, we need to examine the Grotrian diagrams for the helium-1 singlet and triplet lines as presented here and as previously discussed in this video. 
In addition, I list all of the helium transitions for helium-1 which have been detected in chromospheric emission spectra as reported in these papers. If you examine the first of these three papers, you will notice that there is a significant overpopulation of triplet lines relative to singlet lines when examining intensities, and this overabundance remains unexplained. It is evident, of course, that a buildup of the 1s1, 2p1 state can exist in the triplets. This is because any electron which reaches the 2p orbital cannot transition back to the 1s state in that case, as such transitions are spin forbidden. As a result, the 1s1, 2p1 triplet state comes to act as an apparent ground state for the triplet. Of course, the proper ground state for helium-1 should be 1s2. Consequently, the 2p to 2s transition in the triplet in the IR at 10,830 angstroms is 60 times more intense than the 2p to 2s transition in the singlet at 20,581 angstroms, as can be learned in the third paper. This can be accounted for by the buildup of the 1s1, 2p1 state in the triplet. However, two problems remain with the overpopulation of the triplet state. If it is true that helium emission lines are produced by photoionization or collisional ionization followed by recombination, as we saw in this video, then why does the 1s1, 2p1 state in the triplet get to build up at all? Secondly, why are the transitions from the upper orbitals down to the 2p orbital so powerful in the triplet? This is especially true of the 3s, 2p transition in the triplet versus the same transition in the singlet. Just have a look at this figure. The triplet 3s, 2p line at 7065 angstroms or 706.5 nanometers is clearly seen, whereas the corresponding singlet line which should appear at 7281 angstroms or 728.1 nanometers is not present at all. This is a clear sign that preferential chemical selection is happening relative to the triplet line because if the processes were completely random, these two lines should be nearly iso-intense. In the chromospheric emission spectrum, the D3 line at 5867 angstroms is very strong as can be seen in this figure. This fact is also apparent by examining figure 9.2 in Zirin's classic text. This is also the only chromospheric line which can be seen in absorption, as we shall soon learn. Once again, the helium-1 triplet lines at 10,830 angstroms and at 7065 and 4713 angstroms are easily detectable in the chromosphere. From this diagram, it is clear that helium is completely different from the other noble gases, as it manifests numerous emission lines in the chromospheric spectrum, and the triplet lines are being preferentially enhanced. In this regard, helium is acting much more like magnesium or calcium, hence its reclassification on the Sun as a group 2A element. But what is most stunning relative to signs of chemistry is the presence of the 4686 angstrom line from helium-2 as can be seen by examining figure 9.2 in Zirin's classic text. This line represents a transition from the 4s, p, d, or f orbitals to various third principal quantum number orbitals. The 4686 angstrom line from helium-2 is also seen very clearly in the lower chromosphere in these two papers, and I urge everyone to go have a look at their figures. Now one has to ask, why were these important works left in archives or published in the Journal of Advanced Research of the University of Cairo? The reason appears clear. The indisputable finding of a helium-2 line so low in the solar atmosphere poses a huge problem for the standard solar model. If one examines this figure adapted from the Journal of Advanced Research, one can see the source of the problem. In this figure, the helium-2 line at 4686 angstroms is plotted as a function of height above the solar surface. The line is seen down to a height of only 400 kilometers, which is near the bottom of the solar chromosphere and at an apparent temperature of less than 5000 Kelvin. You recall from this video that some lines of the solar chromosphere extend to more than 5,000 kilometers above the solar surface. Given that the temperature of the solar chromosphere is less than 10,000 Kelvin in the standard solar model, then it is impossible to account for the presence of the helium-2-4686 angstrom line in this region of the solar atmosphere as well. 
I had already discussed the use of photoionization to account for the helium-1 lines in the chromosphere in this video, and collisional ionization has also been proposed by solar physicists. Now, the presence of helium-2 lines in the solar chromosphere is a real problem for the standard solar model because they cannot be accounted for using temperature effects. Bazin and Kuchmi comment relative to the presence of the helium-2-4686 angstrom line that the origin of ionization is not well understood. They also propose that the corona is actually penetrating the chromosphere. Of course, the invocation of photoionization and collisional ionization is somewhat irrational. How can astrophysics claim that helium in the chromosphere is being photoionized using coronal photons or collisionally ionized with electrons or hydrogen, yet there is no evidence for such ionization for all other chromospheric elements? Clearly, photoionization or collisional ionization is not the answer. Bazin et al. envision that the corona is penetrating the chromosphere. Rather than recognizing that chemistry is at play both in the corona and in the chromosphere, the corona differs from the chromosphere in that different chemical species are involved in producing coronal versus chromospheric lines. It is not a question of differences in temperature, as the standard model incorrectly assumes, because it ignores chemistry. The corona is not at millions of degrees, as clearly evidenced by the fact that helium-2 is known to exist in the corona with increasing solar activity. I have previously stated in these papers that coronal emission lines reflect electron capture, whereas chromospheric emission lines are the result of hydrogen and proton capture. The answer in both cases rests in chemistry, not in temperature. Now let's examine this series of images taken as a function of solar activity in the helium-2 line at 304 angstroms, which represents a 2p to 1s transition for the lone electron of the helium ion. It is readily apparent that with increasing solar activity, the helium-2 emissions are greatly enhanced around the sun and further that these emissions are taking place well into the corona. To help make the point clear, here is an overlap of a coronal image during an eclipse and a helium-2 image from this collection at maximal activity. Does everyone see the problem? If the corona really exists at millions of degrees, then the helium-2 should not be present in this region, as helium should be fully ionized. You can learn all about this on this web page, where using the Saha equation, astronomers argue that helium is fully ionized at 40,000 Kelvin. Then if that is true for helium, then how can the corona possibly be at millions of degrees as no helium-2 lines should be seen in the corona at all? This serves to highlight once again that the corona does not sustain temperatures in the millions of degrees as I have highlighted repeatedly in my papers and in these videos. So if you ever hear an astronomer tell you that the corona is at millions of degrees, just send them this group of images of the sun taken in helium-2 and ask them how it could possibly be true. Obviously, any claim that the corona is at millions of degrees is simply not reasonable. As a result of all this, it is extremely likely that helium is participating in chemical processes on the sun, as seen in this figure. That is why we can see so many helium emission lines in the chromosphere, not only from helium-1, but most importantly from helium-2. This is also why we should consider helium to be acting as a group 2a element on the Sun. One of the many problems with the standard solar model is that it continually ignores the possibility that chemical reactions are taking place on the Sun. But chemical reactions can indeed be responsible for promoting electrons to higher orbitals prior to photon emission and relaxation back to lower orbitals. That is why none of the emission lines in the chromosphere or in the corona have anything to do with temperature. On Earth, one of the most beautiful examples of chemical processes in the production of light rests in the chemiluminescence of the well-known firefly. In that case, the enzyme luciferase is involved in light production in association with the cleavage of ATP by deluciferin, followed by oxygen addition as shown here. One gets light emission in a manner never even considered by astrophysics. In fact, chemiluminescence is common in chemistry. Chemiluminescence is also the means by which 4th of July glow sticks work. 
In that case, this chemical reaction is involved, but it is still uncertain that 1,2-dioxethane dione even exists as it has never been isolated. Still, glow sticks are commonly used despite uncertain chemistry. In any event, chemical condensation has the ability to produce light as we saw long ago with the silver cluster reactions in this video. The lesson of the fireflies for astrophysics is simple. Stop thinking only of temperature and start thinking about chemistry if you want to understand the production of all chromospheric and coronal lines. Think of the fireflies when you examine emission lines in the atmosphere of the sun. Now before I close the video, I also want to address the one helium line which is present in absorption, namely the D3 line at 5875.6 angstroms. This line represents a transition from a triplet 2p orbital to a triplet 3d orbital. The helium D3 line is not usually seen in the quiet sun except within active regions as can be learned in this thesis. But the D3 absorption line is clearly observed in the second solar spectrum. Let's begin by examining this region of the Fraunhofer spectrum at 5875.6 angstroms in the Paris Fraunhofer data. That is the position of the famous D3 line in the chromospheric spectrum. This is the line which led to the discovery of helium on the sun in 1868 as one can learn in the summary. However, the line is not easily detected in the Fraunhofer spectrum and it is not assigned by the Paris Observatory. The line is simply too weak. However, have a look at the second solar spectrum provided by Gandorfer. Wow, the D3 line is highly polarized and jumps out of the Fraunhofer spectrum where it was essentially undetectable. This is one of the most beautiful findings in all of the second solar spectrum because we see helium both polarized and in absorption, not simply in emission. The question is, why is helium so strongly polarized? I believe that the answer once again lies in the fact that it is being coordinated in the chromosphere of the sun. So one has to think about chemistry in this case, and that might explain the strong polarization observed in the helium D3 line. It is reasonable to postulate that chemical reactions account for emission lines both in the chromosphere and in the corona, as I have previously outlined in these papers. I believe that we are witnessing chemistry as we monitor the chromospheric spectrum. This includes the emission lines from helium-1 and helium-2. Nothing is random in this region of the sun. Producing a helium ion as a result of chemical reactions is much more reasonable of an explanation than photoionization or collisional ionization as currently proposed in astrophysics. After all, if all such processes were truly valid in the chromosphere, then why not photoionize or collisionally ionize all the elements in this region? Clearly, this is not happening in the lower chromosphere as it is overwhelmingly neutral. That is why chemiluminescence is much more reasonable of an explanation relative to the production of chromospheric emission lines. But once again, such an idea calls into question everything relative to the physics of the solar atmosphere. Nonetheless, with all this in mind, I hope that you will remember the fireflies and think of them if ever you have a chance to observe the chromosphere during a solar eclipse. Well, that is all for now. So if you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on the next video.